Now, let me begin this series with this simple introduction. A lot of us have a lot of things that dominate our life, okay? And we have a lot of things, even as believers in Christ, that unbeknownst to ourselves, they take the place of God in our lives and they become the center of our life. Jason, there's a ring up here. You can just mute all these um, mics on the platform and bring me down the monitor a little bit, then I'll be just fine up here. That'll take care of that. So we say we would like for Jesus to be the center, but there's a lot of things that take the place of God in our life. Let me speak for myself, and you can speak for yourself. I have issues. Don't nobody say amen. Good. Yeah, I, I do. I have issues. So um, I have favorite things that I like to do. And if I don't balance my life well, those favorite things can consume me. Are you with me? Come on. Can we be honest with ourselves? Yeah. So I got a couple of pictures of some of my favorite things that I just love doing. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I want to walk you through my things and then um, you can see what, this is one of them, okay? Isn't that a beauty? Now that's a bicycle right there. Yeah. You don't call that a bicycle. That's a cycle. Um, I love cycling. Um, and I will mess around and spend a lot of money on a cycle. Uh, sometimes I hate to confess this, but something like that will cost more than some of the cars we drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That baby's like carbon fiber, man. You can pick it up with one finger, you know. <laughs> but if I'm not careful, that thing will consume my life, and it could end up being God in my life. Are you with me? I got another one. Go to the other um, next one real quick. I like scuba diving. Yeah. Um, isn't that fun to dive with sharks and... Oh, come on, y'all, bunch of wimps. To go down there and challenge that jerker to open his mouth and you just evade him. Come on. I love that. I love, I love, I love being on the bottom of the ocean. I do. I mean, I, um, my wife would tell you, we'll go on vacation, and this is what she says to me while we're on vacation. All you do is dive and sleep. You just dive and sleep. You just dive I just love, I mean, if there's a reason to pray, that'll give you one right there. <laughs> you know, I love, I love scuba diving, but if I'm not careful, that thing will become the center of my life because I find myself saving a lot of money so I can go do that because I like it. Are you with me? Go to the next slide. Go to the next one real quick. Go to the next one. Now, that's the beauty right there. Before I go to heaven, yeah. That's called a BMW i8. Now, that's a hybrid. Now, isn't that just, come on, y'all. I mean, all over heaven, that stuff's going to be there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just going to, I look at that thing and I just say, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> it's a weakness of mine, you know, and if I'm not careful, um, BMWs will consume my life because I love them. I think they're the only types of car on the face of the earth. And that little puppy right there, I could never afford it, but it's like a beauty. I, I, that thing could become the center of my life. Are you with me? And matter of fact, if you've come to my home, some of you said, boy, you got a real problem. I do. I do have a problem with these cars. Go to the next slide real quick, okay? Um, I'm, uh, y'all better stop it. <laughs> this is my team collegiately. Somebody last night had the nerve to text me in the middle of my study talking about I'm at the CU game and CU is getting ready to play Arizona. I feel for you, pastor, this person by the name of Kevin Baker, I don't know who he is. But anyway, at the end of the game, if you, had, if you guys are college fans, y'all know what happened. God showed up. Yeah. <laughs> And CU is still praying on the field, but you kind of get the idea, okay? But if I'm not careful, let me tell you how this impacted me. I'm studying, and then I got that text, and for the remainder of the day, I'm keeping my eye 
on the television waiting for the game to start because I got distracted. You kind of get what I'm saying? I hurried up my study so I could see the game because I love it that much. And it can become the center. Does that make sense, guys? Go to another one. This one is for y'all. This one is for, for, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. That's for y'all, yeah. That's for y'all, yeah. Every time you show up in here with an orange jersey, <laughs> you're communicating what the center of your day is. Are you with me? Matter of fact, see them two right there? Look at them. Look at them right up front. Yeah, see, they came. Hey, man, talking about they come to worship. Sure you did. Yeah. <laughs> Your mind on that, <laughs> you kind of get the feel. But it becomes, it, it consumes us, and it becomes the center of what we do. And, you know, we can't do anything right because the game, the game, the game. You, come on, guys. Let's just be honest this morning as we talk about going into the issue of the, the book of Colossians. Now, go to this last one real quick. Now, um, so here, there's another one. Go to the last one real quick. I think there's one after that. Is there? Are we doing? Okay, good. So here's the question I want to ask. Who or what is at the center of your life? I want you to process this question as we go into today's lesson. Because I'm going to be one of the guys that will say to you, it's easy to say Jesus is. But the question really becomes, is he? Right? Let's be honest this morning. It's easy to say Jesus is, but like I was sharing this past Wednesday, when the trouble surfaced, the issue really becomes, is he? Does that make sense? Turn it in real quick and say, neighbor. Who is at the center of your life? Go to the next, the next uh, slide, and I kind of want to walk through. So I want to ask you a question this morning and for the next few weeks and for the remainder of your life. Consider replacing everything at the center of your life with one person. Next slide. And call his name that. Yeah, yeah. Consider replacing everything in your life with one person. And call his name. Now, let me tell you what that looks like, and we'll walk through this. It doesn't mean you can't have the fast BMWs. It doesn't mean that you can't be a Bronco fan. It doesn't mean that you can't have the nice bicycles and go diving. It doesn't mean that you cannot enjoy life. But it does mean this. Whenever he calls, nothing else matters. You kind of get what I'm saying? Solomon puts it this way, there's a season and a time and a place for everything under the sun, okay? Don't let anything call you and you tell him to wait. Because then don't say he's the center of our life. Come on, say amen this morning, okay? I want, I want to walk with me. I want to kind of talk. Let's go to the next one, and I'm just going to walk through this, this thing. So here's a word that I want to invite you all to... Lock into your spirit. Is this word called Christocentric? That's going to be the title for this series. And what it really means is Jesus at the center. I like that so much, I'm going to brand that and trademark that. And I'm going to have t-shirts. Yeah, so get yours while they are still hot off the press. Can you see, remember the WWJD thing? It's going to say Christocentric. That's what it's going to say now, is that Jesus at the center. Come on, repeat after me. Say, Jesus at the center. Jesus. Say it again. Say, Jesus at the center. Go to the next slide as we kind of move through this. So um, here's what that word means. It means having Jesus at the center or a totally Christocentric theology. I'm just going to walk through this because I just want to lay introduction. And what that means, everything about me theologically is centered on Jesus being in the middle or Jesus being in the center. Imagine a Christocentric life. Everything about my life means that Jesus is at the middle or Jesus at the center. Imagine a Christocentric religion, right? My belief system is centered around Jesus being in the middle of anything that I believe or worship. Imagine a Christocentric church. Jesus being the center of why we do what we do. Come on, wouldn't that be some awesome, guys? Imagine a Christocentric or a Christ-centered marriage. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on. 
I'm talking no more arguments. I'm talking no more frustration. Y'all not hearing me. I'm talking just peace and serenity. Imagine Christocentric relationships amongst members of the body of Christ. Imagine no more backstabbing, no more talking about, no more frustration, no more, are you with me? I think when we get to heaven, that is what it's going to be like. Because if you look at the book of Revelation, it talks about there's not going to be any need for sun, any need for moon, because Jesus is going to be at the center of it all. Emanating like, come on, that's, that's something worth celebrating. So go to the next slide. I want to spend some time. And we're going to be talking through this in the book of Colossians. This is what Colossians is all about. Putting Jesus in the middle or putting Jesus at the center or making Jesus the basis for everything that we say and or do. Now go to the next slide as we kind of walk through this. So I just want to give you some simple things and all the notes are up there if you want more detail. Colossians itself was written by Paul. Um, Paul, who is the author of the book, when you read Colossians, you're going to find that he, has never, he had never made it to Colossae. He's never visited Colossae. So when you read the book, you're going to see him sending a lot of greetings, especially on the last chapter 4, greeting this person, greeting that person. is because he was not a part of the church plant in Colossians, but he's the author of, he wrote, of who wrote the book. The book itself was written, when you say, where was it written? It was written around the year AD 60 to 62 when Paul was encountering his first prison confinement in Rome. He was in Rome, he was hanging out there, he was in prison for the preaching of the gospel, and he wrote this book. Some scholars will say that Timothy was his scribe because when you read verse 1, it's going to say Paul and Timothy to the believers and the saints at the church at Colossae. Colossae, they were responsible for writing this book. The book was um, written and delivered to places like uh, Ephesus and Philemon. And this scribe or this person, this transporter by the name of Tychius and Onesimus, was responsible for delivering the book itself. Um, when we read the book, today we're going to see this guy by the name of Epaphrodus, who was probably the founder of the church in Colossae. But what's important is that we know that Paul was the writer of the book. So why is it so important? Here's what was going on. New Testament theology teaches that Jesus is at the center of everything. They were these heretics that were teaching the Colossians believer that no, Jesus is not at the center of everything. And they were trying to remove him or they were dispelling the truth when Jesus said that I am God incarnated. I'll explain that in a little while. And they were teaching this false doctrine to the church at Colossae to get them to remove Christ from the center of their life. So Paul does a phenomenal job in teaching and writing to the church at Colossae of the importance of Jesus remaining at the center. So he uses a lot of huge terms like talks about the preeminence of Christ, the deity of Christ, the, just the supremacy of Christ. All of that is found in the book of Colossians. Now, if you want to know how to apply the book of Colossians, and we'll talk about that along the continuum as we go, a lot of us, if you were to talk to people today in the world, they'll tell you it's not important to have good theology. Um, it's not important to know such and such about God. The book of Colossians dispels a lot of that truth. Does anybody in here know the more you know about a person, the more you can love them? Come on, come on, are you with me? Here's what I like about the book of Colossians. It proves and it argues for the proof that Jesus is God in his fullness. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about that next week. Here's the beauty of that. I have the spirit of Christ or Jesus living where? That's some heavy stuff. Now, if Jesus is the fullness of God incarnated, when you see Christ... You see God. Oh, come on, track with me this morning, y'all. So here's how it looks. If he lives in me and he dwells within me, when a person sees me, yeah, 
Yeah, come on, y'all, okay? When I behave or conduct myself in public, everything about me ought to emanate what? Because he lives where? So if a person really wants to see God, all they ought to do is look at you and look at The reason a lot of folk don't want to see God is because they see us. And we name the name of God. So you see the importance of this theology. And, 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 and the heretics were trying to keep God away from being incarnated in the earth realm. So they were teaching against these things. And Paul write this letter to kind of encourage the Colossians to get to where they need to go. So let's kind of walk through the book. And I'm just going to read the first 13 verses and just kind of want to lay some foundation down. And then next week we're going to start to really get deep in it. So go to the first. I just want three simple things that I'm going to share with you as we kind of go to the next one. Um, three simple things. So let me kind of read the big idea of Colossians real quick. So listen to this. In this book, the Apostle Paul described Jesus with some of the loftiest language in all of the New Testament, focusing on Christ's preeminence and sufficiency in all things. Paul presented Christ as the center of the universe, not only as the active creator, but as the recipient of creation. Paul, I hope you know what that means. He didn't only create it, but God gave it to him to own it. In his taking on human flesh. Next one. Keep moving with me as we kind of read. Christ was and is the invisible image of the visible image of the invisible God containing within himself the fullness of deity. And because of his divine nature, Jesus is sovereign above all things. He with an authority given him by the Father. As such, Jesus is also head of what? Keep going to the next one real quick. Okay, look at this. He, was, he has reconciled all things to himself through his death on the cross. Man, what an important statement. What an important statement. What an important statement. He has reconciled all things through himself through his death on the cross. Let me just say this real quick. If we get the book of Colossians, I'm guaranteeing you, you won't struggle with life no more. If we get it, it's kind of like... See you guaranteeing a win over Arizona, right? Sure, okay. But I'm trying to say to you, if we get this, you'll understand on Calvary, all the addictions, all the problems, all the sickness, all the crazy stuff was dealt with, and God handed that to us. Man, I want you all to get this. We can go through this. So making believers alive to God and sending them on a path to what was that? Right living. So this proper view of Christ served as the antidote for the Colossian heresy as well as the building block for Christian life and doctrine both back then and both now. Now before I go to my big idea, which is the next slide, go ahead and turn that because I'm reading a little while. Let me say this to you right now. The reason this issue of of same-sex marriage Uh, As subtle as marijuana laws being passed in Colorado and all the crazy stuff that's going on, it's the heretics trying to remove Jesus from the center. So don't say Colossians was back then. It doesn't have nothing to do with me now. The principles transfer. Does that make sense, guys? Are you with me? Because you've got a track with me. Homosexuality was prevalent, drug, sex, the, all that stuff was prevalent back there, and it was trying to infiltrate the church, and if they can remove Christ from the church, those things had free reign in the church. No different than today. If Christ is removed from the church, the church will look like the world. Oh, come on, somebody say amen. And we need to fight against it. So here's the big idea of what what I want to share with you today. The gospel points to the hope stored up in heaven, which enables believers to express their faith in Christ and their love for others. Believers are also to be filled with the knowledge of God. Let me say it again. Believers got to be filled with the knowledge of God. And I'm going to say it this way. You don't know what you don't know. But if you're open to knowing what you don't know, you'll change some behaviors. Oh, come on, say amen. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know, but if you're open to learning and receiving what you don't know, it'll cause you to change some behaviors, okay? So you're supposed to be filled with the knowledge of God, which is centered on the redemptive work through his beloved son so that we can live lives worthy of the gospel we have received. Ah, come on, say amen. Go to the next one and let me kind of read and kind of walk through. So look at, look at verse 1 of the book of Colossians. 
and I'm going to move quick. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, I'm in verse 1 of Colossians chapter 1, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, and look at verse 2, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, and he says, grace to you and peace from who? God our Father. Come on, say, Paul was an apostle. Say that real quick with me. One more time. Say again. Say, Paul was an apostle. So, so notice the, the genitive of possession. His apostleship was not a man-made thing, but he's saying an apostle of Christ. Paul belonged to Christ as we go into the verse. So he's saying to the church at Colossae, listen, man didn't call me, man didn't send me, Christ did. Come on, say amen, okay? And then notice the same thing. By the will of God, and he's making mention now of Timothy's brother. So what he's saying here is that my apostleship was to realize God's will, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what the will of God is, okay? So his apostleship enabled him and empowered him to do the things that God has called him to do. Does anybody in here realize with me that God knew you before the foundations of the world, and he has a specific assignment for you to do? Come on, say amen if you know that. Okay. Now, let me set the record here so we kind of go through. Now, the specific assignment that he has to do might not have anything. But let me just go here. It doesn't have anything to do with your spiritual gift, but it has everything to do with what he wants done through you in the earth. And let me just go here and say this, and we'll talk about it later. Every, excuse the grammar, every last and one of us up in here have been called by God to propagate the gospel in the earth realm. Now check this out. The reason all the craziness, let me just use Paul's term, all the heresy is happening in society today is because the church is silent and we're not living out the will of God. Because here's what we say, I'm not gifted to do that. <laughs> We all have a charge to proclaim the gospel of Christ. So Paul lays foundation. Now go to the second slide, and I want to walk through verses 1 through 8. I'm not going to be long before you this morning because I want you to read. Now watch this. The gospel points to the hope stored up in heaven, which enables believers to express their faith in Christ and their love for others. Say hope. Now everybody got to say it together. Come on, say hope. hope. Say faith. faith. Say love. love. One more time. Everybody say it. Say hope. Say faith, faith. say love. love. One more time. Everybody say it together. Say hope, hope. say faith. faith, say love. love. Now let me give you application first. If you have issues with people on the face of the earth, you don't understand faith, hope, and love. I'm just going to say it so we can kind of work through it together. Are you with me? I want you all to hear me. If you struggle with the person says to you next to you or the neighbor that's sitting beside you, you don't understand faith, hope, and love. So here's how part of the big idea, you don't know what you don't know, but when you start to understand what you don't know, it'll change behaviors. Come on, say amen. The importance of the book of Colossians. So let's read. So notice what he says, verse 3. We thank God, that's Paul and Timothy, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your what? Faith in Christ Jesus and of the what? Love you have for all the saints. Look at verse 5. Because the hope laid up for you in heaven, and it says, of this you have heard before the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the world, um, it is bearing fruit and increasing as it is also does among you since the day you heard it and understood. Come on, say hear and understand. Hear. Now look at verse 11. The grace of God in truth, verse 7, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the spirit, okay? Um, go back to verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, on this you have heard um, before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it is also does among you since the day you heard it and understood. The grace of God in truth. Come on, say grace. Come on, say it again. Say grace. 
Look at verse 7. For just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love for Christ. Say faith. I mean, say hope. hope. Say faith. faith. Say love. love. Now, let me, let me just sum this up like that. I'm just going to give you a big idea preaching here just at the high level. Epaphras was Paul's servant who was sent to serve him while he was incarcerated or imprisoned in Rome. Okay, so now Paul had never been to Colossae, but we can safely assume that Epaphras was probably from that region of Colossae somewhere. This guy spends time at the feet of Paul. At least listen to the words I'm using. Paul being his apostle, him being servant to Paul, he goes back to Colossae where they had never heard about God. And he plans the church. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay. This is what he's saying in that first few verses. So now he plans the church. Here's how people came to faith in Christ. It began with, he with hearing about the gospel. The gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what the gospel contained. It contained the grace and the truth about who God really is. Oh, I need somebody to say amen because I'm getting excited all, all by myself. Because there was a false truth being taught to the Colossi believers that Jesus is not the center. And then Epaphras, uh, Epaphras shows up and then he speaks now the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of the grace of the gospel. Does anybody in here know what grace is? Oh, come on, don't fool me now. Don't, don't fool me. Don't, don't fool me. Don't fool me. If you know what grace is, say amen. amen. Let, let, me, let, me, let me help you out. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Let me tell you what that means in English. It's something you get that you don't deserve. If you hadn't done nothing wrong, you don't need grace. But if you're human under the sound of my voice, I'm trying to let you know that you need grace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we understand the truth about grace, lock into this really quick, because I'm going somewhere with this. And you are a recipient of grace. You become naturally disqualified from looking down the lens of your nose at anybody else, talking about anybody else, because were it not for the grace of God, we would be that person. Are you with me? So if you understand grace, you don't have time to be mad with people or upset with folk or angry with folk or hold enemies. You don't have time for none of that kind of foolishness because but for the grace of God. Ah, ah, maybe you're not hearing me. The only reason you're not on the streets of Colfax this morning is because of the grace of God. Come on, y'all not hearing me this morning. The only reason you have a place to live this morning is because of the grace of God. Y'all not hearing me this morning. The only reason you've got that college education is because of the grace of God. You're not hearing me this morning. The only reason you have money in the bank, you're able to eat a meal this morning, is because of the grace of God. You're not hearing me this morning. The only reason you have clothes on your back is because of the grace of God. The the only reason you own the businesses that you do is because of the grace of God. It's not that you're all that good. It's not that you're all, oh, I wish I had somebody in here. It's not because you think you're all that. It's because of the grace of God. You ought to hear me this morning. Because Romans still stands true. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all deserve death. Are you hearing me this morning? He shows up and he tells him about the grace of God. And then he attaches to it the truth of the fact, listen to this, the truth of the gospel. It was Jesus on that cross, not some strange man. <laughs> Let me begin the process of getting deeper. It was God on that cross. <sighs> Y'all will get that four weeks from now. 
Are you hearing me? It should have been you. It should have been. Now forget y'all. It should have been me. Because I know what I did. You can act like you hadn't done anything. Are you with me? But we should have been the ones hanging on that cross but grace. So lock into this, lock into this. I'm going somewhere with this. So Epaphras, Epaphras, I'm messing up his name, shows up in Colossae and he talks about the grace of God and the truth of the grace of God. And then he attaches to that thing this word called hope. And here's what hope says. Just like, 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 but let me, let me read it. Look at, look at the verse real quick. Let me find that verse real quick. He speaks about, let me see, because, okay, verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you, where? And he says, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. He talks about grace and truth. Then he talks about hope. Here's what he says about the hope of God. The way things look right now it's not always going to be like that. <laughs> and then he says, God has a solution to everything we're encountering right now. Hope, okay? But then this is going to jack you up. Don't look for it here. It's stored up. Yeah, yeah. The reason I get frustrated with God is because I want mine now. I'm like that prodigal son. Father, give me my share of the inheritance so I can squander it with riotous living. Because that's what we do. Come on. But, but the best hope you can have is in the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. So listen to how he, this is what you need to know about, about, about God's bio sketch. When, when Epaphos says that hope is stored up for you in heaven and you've heard about it, he says, I'm telling you about a God that can deliver. Okay, a God that has history, a God that had proven himself faithful because the Colossians had heard about the exodus from Egypt, how God was faithful. He'd heard about the Israelites from the Philistine, how God was faithful. So here's what he's really saying to them. The grace of God says, God's not promising you he's going to do something for you that he's incapable of doing. If God said it, it's going to happen. Are you with me? So lock into this. So they responded... Here's my next word, in faith. They believed it even though they hadn't seen it. Ah, hope, faith. It resulted in faith, okay? And then this faith, he says, is being spread throughout the world. And this is the same thing that happened to you at Colossians. So listen to his prayer now. I thank God how you're able to love and listen to the words all the saints, okay? That word love, unconditional love, not phileo brotherly love, okay, but unconditional love. Here's how they're able to love unconditionally. They understood grace. They don't deserve it. Are you with me? They have a, a, a vision of hope that what we see right now is not what it's always going to be. It resulted in their faith or them accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then now they're able to love others into relationship with God. What a concept. What a concept. So here's Paul's prayer. Man, you Colossians are a trip. You guys don't have enemies. Y'all just love each other. And here's what they say. Paul, we don't have a choice but to love because were it not for the grace of God, we'd be said individual. Come on, I need at least two amens this morning. Because I'm trying to help us to know what we don't know so it can change our behavior. Are, are you hearing me this morning? It ought to shape the way. So, 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 so hope, I mean, the, the faith in God says I trust God. And because I trust God, I develop faith in him. And I demonstrate my faith in God by loving my brothers. So I thank God for that. Now go to the second thing real quick because this is where I just want to hinge this and then we're going to pick this up next week with the remaining verse. So now look at this. So, and I want you all to hear this carefully. Believers are to be, what's that word? What's that word? With what? The knowledge of God which is centered on his what? Redemptive work through his beloved son so that we can, what's the next phrase? 
Worthy of what? We have what? I want us to say that one more time because I just want to explain this, then we're going to stop. Believers ought to be what? Filled with the what? Knowledge of God, which is centered on his what? Redemptive work through his beloved son. And here's the reason. So we can what? Live lives worthy of what? We have what? Now, let me, let me play with this for a little while. We have to be filled with the knowledge of God, which is sent toward his redemptive work, so through his beloved son, so we can live lives worthy of the, what's that word? Not what we deserve or not what we worked for or not what we earn, but through the what? Gospel we have received. Let's read, leave that up there. Can we, we'll put on oh, the back screen is fine. I want to read this. Verse 9. And so... From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Point to yourself. Say, self, in my prayer, pray for the members of my church. Now, this is free. Say, don't talk about them. <laughs> pray for them. <laughs> okay. The reason you're praying for them is because... They have to live life worthy of the gospel they've received. But before they can do it, the person who's praying has to be living it. Don't pray for me if you ain't right. That spirit might just, like how grandma would say, jump on me. I don't want your stuff if it ain't right. <laughs> so make sure you're living a life worthy of the gospel before you confront me. Are you with me? Here's New Testament of gospel theology. Don't tell somebody to remove the plank from their eye when you've got a forest in your own. <laughs> Paraphrase, but you kind of get the feel. Are you with me? Now let's go to work. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Just give me a few minutes here. Look at this. Verse 9, and from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his what? In all spiritual wisdom, and what's that word? Now, filled, uh, let me belabor this for a little while because we messed this up. You may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And verse 10 says, here's the hina or the in order clause. So that you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing. And then it gives you some reason, okay. So let me say this real quick. Say, filled with the knowledge of the will. Now, here's what I want you to understand about this. The prayer is, let me go here, then I'll back up. I want you to understand what Calvary is all about. This is what Paul is saying to the Colossians. The word will or thelema that's written here is not so much God's plan for your life. That's not it. Okay. Because we focus so much on that. We miss what God did. Ah, Jesus. And so when God asks us to do, here's what we say. It's not my gift. This ain't about you. You behave based on what he did, not what you want. I'm going to say it again. So Paul saying to the church, and I want you all to do your own study on that. Filled with the knowledge of his will. What is his will, Paul, to the church at Colossians? His will is that none perish, but that all come to repentance. So I want you to understand, number one, this whole issue of hope and grace and truth that what you get is, is the fact that you didn't deserve it in the first place. And if you hang out understanding that, you would be like how Bishop Johnson said at the first night of the conference. If they put a gun to your head, you're going to say, pull the trigger because I am filled with the knowledge of his will. I know what God has done for me, and so I know what he wants me to do. So I understand Calvary, and because I understand Calvary, I have no choice 
but to pay, place God the center. <laughs> Let me meddle for a little while. So I don't care what time the Bronco plays, if there's church at that time. <laughs> Let me meddle for a little while. I don't care what's happening in the world, if there's prayer at that time. I don't care what's going on because I am filled with the knowledge of what happened on Calvary. Ah! And my problem and your problem is, is we don't understand Calvary like that. So we prioritize over ourselves. And when you look at the center, it's really us sitting there, not Jesus. Ah! Me, myself, and I. Because... Him, me and God don't have it like that. Excuse the grammar. He, come on, say filled with the knowledge of his will. I'm going to show you that in a little while. Verse 10, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And look at this, doing what? Bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. All endurance and patience and joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of life. Let me just pull one out of that four member list. Bearing fruit. If I were to ask you, I know this is going to sound convicting. When was the last time you led a person to Christ? What would you say to me? Don't answer. Right? So when God looks at me and he looks at you and he says, Felix, if you're filled with the knowledge of my will and you understand Calvary, one of the outcomes is that you should produce fruit. Right? I can't say to him, well, God, I sang on the worship team. He's going to say, that's not fruit. That was you using your gift. If I said to him, I served in children's ministry, that's not fruit. That was you using your gift. And a lot of us mistake our gift for service. So here's how we thank God for Calvary. We use our gifts. Hear me out. If I understand the knowledge of God's will... I produce fruit because this is what this is all about. I'm going to land in a little while. God saved you so you can partner with him in telling the world that Jesus is at the center. So they can put faith in him. They can appreciate his grace. They can put their hope in the future that he has for them. And they can respond in love. The reason the world is going haywire is because the church is too busy using its gifts. Annual days and parties and, and nobody is beating the streets anymore, talking to their neighbor, telling them about the goodness of God. You guys hear me? I'm going to show you something in a little while, Okay. I was at Starbucks this morning, and I'm at Starbucks every Sunday morning, really, really early in the morning, some ungodly hours. And I guess there's this young lady that likes to bug me, because when I go to Starbucks, I go to zone out, just me and God, want to internalize my message. So she feels the need to come and sit at the same table that I'm sitting. And I have love. I want to say, can you go somewhere else? Don't you see how big this place is? I really want to say that. But then every time this young lady comes, and I'm at Starbucks at like ungodly hours, um, God keeps saying to me, reciprocate what I did for you. Right? So over time, I got it. She messed around and asked me, what do you do? What she do that for? <laughs> you know what I mean? So every Sunday has been an evangelistic quest, right? This morning, John Hayes, y'all know John, felt the need to come to my Starbucks to say hi to me. 
John, leave me alone. So John comes to Starbucks, and he's talking, and this lady is sitting there. And I say to him, John, I've been trying to evangelize this lady for months now. And her name is Veronica. And I said, I want you to meet Veronica. I've been trying to get her to come to church. Here's what Veronica said to me. I've been there three or four times, and you didn't even notice. That's deep, isn't it? Seed has been being planted, but th that's the point I want to say, is that seed has been being planted when we do what God calls us to do based on what he did for us. Come on, guys. It's not about the meetings. It's about sharing your faith. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen. It's about telling people without or unapologetically to put Jesus at the center. It's about telling people what Christocentric is all about submitting and surrendering to him. So notice how it says. Look at this. Let me finish right. So it says, verse 11, may be strengthened with all power according to the glorious might for all endurance, patience, and joy. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the what? Inheritance of the saints in light. Look at verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the what? I'm going to shout on that next week. But let me tell you what that's saying really quick. Let me look at verse 12. Verse 12. Look at verse 12, everybody. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. Anybody in here know Christ as Lord and Savior? Come on, just say amen if you're saved. Listen to this. You're qualified. You're qualified. What am I qualified to do, preacher? To share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Remember that hope in heaven? Y'all remember that? You are now guaranteed a seat at the feet of Jesus. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. He has delivered us from what? The domain of darkness. And I like that word. Transferred. To the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption to the forgiveness of sin. Let me say this this way, because I'm going to shout on it next week. If you don't do nothing but tell a person, hey, um, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I'm in the world, but I'm not really of the world. What you mean, man? Well, truth be told, I used to be like you. I don't say it like that, but you get the feel. And, and listen to me carefully now. When I got a revelation, I was filled with the knowledge of God, which is centered on the redemptive work, what he did for me on Calvary. And I know why he did it, through the beloved son. I can live a life worthy of the gospel I have received. So here's what that means. I got to bear fruit. So I... I, I just have to tell you, Annette, about the goodness of God so you can be transferred from darkness into light. Because this world is not your home. So listen to this. This is going to sound crazy right now. Jesus being at the center means, well, let me back up. Remember that picture of that BMW i8? Y'all remember that? If I get one of them, I'm going to repent first. I am, I am. I'm going to make sure there's no tithe money. I'm going to make sure that. I'm going to drive that booger to church and put me a sign right in front of the church that says pastor. It's, it's kind of arrogant, isn't it? Just so everybody who comes to church can be like, wow, now that's a car. That's what I'm talking about. That's a car. And I'm going to get a lot of wows because I'm proud of my car. You ought to be equally as proud of what happened on Calvary for you. Now, don't nobody leave beat up for what I'm about to say. If you can't do that confidently, 
maybe Jesus is not at the center. Because here's what happens. My Wildcats beat CU last night. Thank you. <laughs> here's the first thing I did when I came up. I was so proud of that thing that could potentially be in the center. I walked up to that brother and tapped him on the shoulder. How you like me now? Kind of, when your Broncos win, I got a better one. Somebody had the nerve to send me a text with a bunch of baby bottles with milk in it because Dallas lost. <laughs> ha, I ain't going to mention no name Topaz McBride, but they had the nerve, had the nerve. Derek, you got it too, didn't you? You got it too. Had the nerve to talk about what's at the center of their life. <laughs> Had the nerve because they were so proud of that thing. If Jesus is at the center of the church, we will tell the world, watch this, we win. We win, guys. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. We win. That's what we say. We win. We tell them the good news. We send emails. We'll send texts. We will infiltrate the world because we are qualified because we have transferred from darkness into life. And Jesus really is the center. And everything about us revolves around him. That's what Colossians is. And next week we're going to talk so much about Jesus and what he's all about. But I want to lay the foundation. I want to challenge you today. Can you guys put that, well, this in the top corner, that Christocentric thing? Yeah. I want that to be the heart of this church. Jesus at the center. Man, the Broncos win this weekend. So what? Jesus won. Are you with me? And let's celebrate him first, then everything second. And we be vessels through which he works. So bow your heads with me. Here's how I want to pray this morning. If you have not accepted him as Lord and life, Lord and Savior of your life, perfect chance to come and say to him, Lord, come into my life. Be the center. If you're saved and he has not been the center, perfect time to repent and say, Lord, help me make you the center. So now you understand Paul's prayer in verses 9 through 14. Every time I think about you, I pray that you may be strengthened. If you know him, we're praying for strength this morning so that we can put him first. If you don't know him, we're praying that you would come and say, I want to know him like that. So Holy Spirit, move in this place this morning. Touch hearts. Permeate lives, Lord. You're telling us we're in the world, but we're not of it. Now we're starting to get a feel of what that means. The things of the world should not be first in our lives. Heretic. And that's what was going on in Colossae. They wanted to remove Christ and replace him with the things of the world. But we're going to see next week, in you the fullness of the Godhead dwells, God. So I'm praying that as we wrestle with the book of Colossians, we understand the importance of who you are. And we put you at the center, God. So Holy Spirit, be God in our lives. Be God in our lives. Be God in our lives. We love you, Lord. We love you. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. Come on, stand to your feet, stand to your feet.